Hi, I'm Keegan Flegner. I'm 17 years old and I live in Santa Monica, California. When I was in first grade, I was diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. Since that time, sports have played a huge role in changing my life. So I want to show the world how all kinds of sports can help all kinds of people with all kinds of mental and emotional challenges. Welcome to Sports on the Spectrum. My guest today is Pete Arbogast. When I was nine years old, I started playing basketball in a new league at the Santa Monica YMCA. Pete founded that league and was responsible for everything in it, dealing with players, coaches, referees, parents, and more. In just a few years, the league grew from four to 30 teams and over 250 players. Pete was at every game, keeping statistics and cheering every player, even after they left the league. Pete was a huge supporter and influence on my sports life. He is also the radio announcer for USC Trojans football. Every Saturday in the fall, I could turn on the radio and hear Pete's distinctive voice calling the game and cheering on the Trojans. Pete showed me that anyone could turn a passion into a job for life. He inspired me to try things like student TV in middle school and even this podcast. Please join me in welcoming Pete Arbogast to Sports on the Spectrum. Well, Pete, I think I speak for everybody here, and by that I mean everybody, when I say, how do you do, man? That is the uh, the phrase of the hour, and uh, when something either really good or unusual happens, right. I'll, I'll, I'll whip that out whenever yeah. I can. There you go. Well, I, I definitely think that fits the bill, and I'm sure you would agree, and I would also just say thanks so much for joining us today, and You're I right. think, thank you, and I think that... um. You know, obviously, a lot of people know you for what you've done during your history with the Trojans football, calling games and stuff. But I think uh, they'd also be intrigued to know what your life was like before that, because, you know, obviously you've said it yourself. You you don't usually share these stories outside of what you've done, you know, with the program. So I think our audience would appreciate a little background into basically how you got here. So I'd start by asking, you know, what were really like your you know, obviously, as a commentator for Trojans football, sports has been, you know, detriment, like, you know, beyond influential in your life. But what were your first memories of it that kind of got you into it in a way, you know, and it can be anything. So it's like just kind of. Well, well, my pop was a, my pop was a big sports fan. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I got that growing up. Right. Uh, and, and he was also in the radio business. So I got mm-hmm. that growing yep. up. So yeah, no. you, uh, and, and I before. knew pretty early on when I was a kid um, that I was never going to play in the NBA or anything. Right. Um, so I, I, I wanted to be in sports in some fashion. And I, 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 try, I said, well, I, I can do this. Eventually, I said that because the earliest memory I have, the very earliest memory of sport I have is mm-hmm. watching the 1959 World Series wow. on a black and white TV with my mom. I remember I'm born in 54. So I was, right. I was not yet five. Uh, oh, I mean, and, and I didn't, I didn't know what the world series was. I didn't know what the world series was. I didn't know anything. I just knew that my parents both were rooting for the Dodgers. <laughs> uh, and, and I, so I, that's the first time I knew what that was even mm-hmm. and a little bit later, a couple of years later, my dad had been talking about his high school a lot and he took me to a high school game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marshall High School over in Los Feliz, kind of near okay. the Griffith Park Zoo, the observatory over in yep. that neighborhood. And uh, he, t- he took me to a game and we got to go down uh, low in the stands. You know, I was five and a half maybe. And I remember we played Lincoln and their mascot was a tiger. <laughs> so uh, I was very impressed with the guy who was dressed up as a tiger. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was my, my biggest memory of the game. Okay. Um, those are my earliest memories of sports, and and later I remember being on a on a friend's porch. Uh, there were two things that actually happened. I was on my friend's porch, and we're just playing out in front of the house, uh-huh. and we had a radio in the window, and we were listening to uh, KHJ, uh, at the time was a uh, rock and roll station. Old right. now it then it, that became oldies. Now it's all Hispanic, uh, and, and then they they stopped and a basketball game came on and it was the playoff game between the Lakers and the, at the time, the St. Louis Hawks. Oh, and Chick, and Chick Hearn was doing the play by play. And that's okay. the first time that I ever heard a sporting event on radio. Mm-hmm. And I was mesmerized because I played basketball on the playground like everybody. Right. And I'm, and, and my grandfather and my dad had taken me to at the old sports arena. Right. There was a, uh, 
there was a tournament. It used to be a college tournament in the beginning of the season. Uh, with they bring it was SC and UCLA, and then they bring in six of the best teams in the country. Now mm-hmm. everybody has a tournament now. Right. Uh, you, you, in Christmas time, there's 900 tournaments, but then yep. there weren't that many. And so this was a huge deal because they would bring in six of the best teams from the Midwest to the East mm-hmm. to play SC and UCLA. And, and I got to go to that tournament and watch an SC team that I had heard on the radio. Right. Already. And never so now I got to person. be there. Now I got to be there. It was yep. really cool. Yeah. And the neck, and then, uh, so I kind of melded the two together. And then I started listening to the Dodgers on the radio and, over the course of those few years from 59 to 64, probably, mm-hmm. um, I realized that uh, I can talk. I, I like sports. My dad's in radio. Uh, why don't I, why don't I do that yeah. for a living? And I knew real early what I wanted to do with my life. Well, that's real impressive. Early. That's impressive. Uh, it's yes. Yes. And lucky and lucky. Yes. yes and, yeah. No, you're right. Absolutely lucky too, that you would know what you wanted to do from such an early stage. Cause I mean, I'm 17 years old and I still don't know what I want to do with my life. So it's like, no hurry. There's no hurry. Yeah, no. And I, everybody says that and I totally get it. But at the same time to hear somebody like you be able to figure it out so early just impresses me. And well, you, this- you definitely want to do something you love every Absolutely. day. Absolutely. You don't want to wake up in the morning and go, God, I don't want to go to work today. Right. You want to go to work. Absolutely. And, and you want yeah, to have no. fun. Well, you're def- you, in that sense, you're definitely lucky in that way. And I guess, you know, you, you, in, in that response, you mentioned that you grew up liking listening and watching both, you know, the Dodgers and USC in general. And I would assume, you know, that as you know, your life went on, they still remain some of your favorite teams ever. And I guess um, that built, that kind of leads into my next question, which was why were they, they, your favorite teams? And also maybe like what, who were some specific individuals maybe on those teams that stood out to you and why was that the case? Well, you're here in LA. So you root for your teams. Right. And my dad, like, like these teams, although he's also a Cubs fan, which is kind of, you know, sad. (laughs) Uh, And, and and then I glommed onto the Kings uh, Mm. and the angels at at first, because they were, I was a junior angel when they were first at Dodger stadium and then they moved away the Rams, um, mm-hmm. you know, so you, you just grow up loving these teams and the star players, the Sandy Koufax or the OJ right. Simpson, or the, you know, the Mike Garretts, um, all those guys are, you know, Don Drysdale. But then again, <laughs> I have a yeah. picture of myself when I went to Dodger stadium camera day, you know, everybody goes uh-huh. down the field, takes pictures of their favorite players. And I'm, and I'm posing with Vin Scully and, and, <laughs> And the public address announcer, John Ramsey and Jerry Dog and all the announcer guys. Right. So that's what that's I was already into that. I right. yeah, it was great to get a picture with Drysdale. Sure. Of course. You know, it's like who, who wouldn't want to get a chance at a picture with the, those guys? You know, everybody sure. admires them. And I guess um, kind of talking about those specific moments, you know, obviously it's like those those clearly have an important place in your life. And I guess I'd ask sort of as a quick follow up, you know, were there any other moments in addition that, you know, stood out to you in your sports life that you really did uh, appreciate, you know, and, and again, why was that the case? Well, like I said, I wasn't much of an athlete. I, uh, you know, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off actually, but I, I want, I have a little picture to show for, to show our audience of you playing on the team. Okay. And I think it kind of represents a big, like kind of deja vu for a lot of our audience, that's a, you know, seeing, that's in high school. Yep. That's seeing, high school. Yeah, seeing their idol, you know, it's like put on those short shorts, wear those Chuck oh, tits, yeah. and you know, shoot oh, up the Chuck on. On the time when shooting is like the most foreign idea ever. Well, that that picture uh, was the final uh, point of the Marshall varsity basketball season when I was a senior. Oh, um, we were very good. We were ranked eighth in the city, which is yeah, no joke. I mean, there's right really when you're in LA, teams. that's a very big deal. That's a big deal. Uh, we were really good. Uh, and, and so we usually generally uh, blew out our league opponents. Mm-hmm. And so I got to play a lot in the fourth quarter because right. I was that I wasn't I wasn't a starter. Right. right. Uh, I was the ninth man on an eight man rotation. Mm-hmm. And uh, but I did play a lot in the fourth quarter. And that yep. was the last point of the regular season. Uh, I got fouled with no time left. And the ref oh, was wow. going to take my free throws away. Right. And I said, man, come on, man. I, I hardly ever get to play. You gotta let me <laughs> shoot these free throws. Wow. And he said, all right. Fine. And so I made that one. 
and then the set, the next one I did a I did a complete hook shot from from the free ball <laughs> and it clanked. But that, yeah. so it was just for yeah. fun. No. Um, so that that was a, that was a good memory. That was a great yeah, no. Memory. And I guess that explains too. Like if uh, if our audience was paying attention, there were a bunch of people in the background who you know were clearly were not a part of this game in any way, shape, or form. It's no, like... that's a friend of mine. Still, uh, the guy standing next to me. Oh wow, uh, he was on the TV team with me the year before. Uh, and, and we had shot a lot, you know, we're off to the side right. when the starters are playing, we're off to the side shooting free throws a lot. Right. And, uh, and, but he's still a buddy of mine. He lives up in Seattle now. Uh, oh. Mike Kloff and a uh, good friend of mine. Nice. Yeah. But I mean, it's like with all those other people who are just in casual dress and stuff that explains why they're there, you know, cause it's like the game's over. So. Game was over. Yeah. <laughs> there there are, people are leaving. Yep. There you go. Oh no, that's, that's hilarious. Like, you know, uh, uh, hats off to you for remembering the details out of that one little picture um oh yeah yeah no well i guess um uh i i guess i'll shift now into kind of the stuff that i think a lot of people are here for in a sense you know whether they like it or whether they feel selfish about it or not which is your your history and career as being the usc sportscaster and so you know i guess i'll start off at the beginning by telling me and i know you've kind of answered this but i guess i'll ask for any additional information that might be helpful here how exactly did that come about? You know, where you, you know, yeah. finally recognized I'm going to be, you know, the football announcer for USC. The guy that uh, was uh, preceded me, Tom Kelly, started in 1961. Oh, okay. uh, and and he worked on the radio. Uh, there were a, there were or the TV doing USC right. games from 1961 to 1988. Wow. Uh, so that's a long job. And the guy before him was Chick Hearn from 1956 right. to 1961 right. before he took the Laker job. Right. And, and then me. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there's been basically three guys. Right. Since 1956. So it's a, it's right. a tough job to get. Yep. No, uh, clearly. Uh, uh, let me give you the long story, I guess. Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind. No, not at uh, all. We got time. <laughs> I knew I wanted to be in radio. I knew from an early age, I was a USC fan. My dad was a, a Bruin fan. Wow. And, okay. Uh, worked at, he worked at the UCLA radio station. Okay. And, and they got tickets to everything. Right. Nobody wanted, nobody wanted the tickets to the SC game. So my dad said, I'll take, I'll take the yep. tickets, take my yep. kid to a game. It's free. Yep. So we got to go to the game and the first year was 1962. And uh, I, I went to the Coliseum for the first time. I'm, right. The band was fun. And I watched a white horse run across the field. And the team never lost a game. They won the <laughs> national championship. So right. uh, he lost me right there. Right. I was an SC fan. Right. That no. point on, that was it. No. Uh, in 64, a record album was produced, a vinyl album, by the play-by-play -play mm -hmm. guy, Tom Kelly. Okay. About the 64 season. 64 season was pretty ordinary. Right. Except at the end of the year, they played Notre Dame. Notre Dame Ooh. was number one in the country. They came to the Coliseum in the last game of the year. Right. And uh, SC was down 17 nothing at halftime. My dad came to me. Right. I, I was sitting by myself in the stands right under the press box. He had a seat in the press box, but kids couldn't go to the press box. Right, 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 right. He comes down and goes, you know, it's 17 nothing. You want to go home? And I <laughs> said, well, let's stick around for the beginning of the third quarter, see, if, right. see what happens. And SC came back and won the game 20-17. Yep. It was one of the most amazing games ever yep. so anyway that became a record album uh, right. and i got the record album that summer uh mm -hmm. or when, when did i get that well whenever i got that i mean i wore it out i listened right. to it so much right and that's when i wanted to be usc's radio announcer that's okay I, decided. I asked my dad i said how long is this guy going to do this right uh and he said well he's 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 35 or 40 probably do another 30 years or so and i said well i'll be 36 at the time that'll be perfect yep Great. Hey, it's it's all right. So yeah. we fast forward to I, I, I go to high school. I go to junior college. Uh, I, I go to SC. Mm -hmm. I leave and go do small town radio mm -hmm. uh, in Twin Falls, Idaho. And mm -hmm. then I went to Victorville and then I went to Porterville and okay. Porterville in Central California mm -hmm. uh, was the place where I worked for Monty Moore, who was a Hall of Fame broadcaster for the Oakland days for many years oh. and NBC television. And okay. he taught us, he really, he really ran an all sports station and taught us exactly how to put together a broadcast, talk, call the coaches, uh, prepare a game, right? know how to do it. We did everything. We did football, basketball, baseball, yep. softball. I did a track and field meet on the radio. There you go. You'll do anything, man. 
Yeah. So here, here's the uh, weird part number one. Um, I'm, uh, I'm watching the 1981 World Series. Every, uh, all of the sportscasters have to do a disc jockey shift at the same time on the radio. So you got to play uh-huh. music for three hours a day, plus go out and do a game. Right. Whatever. But part of your duty in the eight-hour day is do three hours of, of playing music. Right. So I was a DJ, a DJ for three hours. Yeah. Uh, this is the last game of the World Series in 1981. So there's no chance I'm going to be turning on the mic and talking. I have a little black and white TV next to me right. I'm watching the World series because I want to watch the Dodgers play the Yankees. They're going to win the world series finally over the damn Yankees. Yep. And, uh, and I, we also had the option of being able to listen to, because we were on the network that carried the Rams, the angels and the Bruins, right. We could click a switch and we could listen to the station in Los Angeles, which was the home base of those three teams. Yep. And the guy, the poor guy on the air in LA on the Rams Bruins Angel Station, uh-huh. Steve Summers, is he is uh, pleading. Nobody's listening to his show, first of all, because they're all yeah. watching the Dodger game. You're right. Everybody. Right. So he's pleading for people to uh, call in and talk about the Dodger game. Uh-huh. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what call me and you could turn down the sound on your TV and you could do play by play of the Dodgers Yankees game <laughs> off the TV on my radio. Show. <laughs> he, he couldn't even finish the sentence. So right. Before you were dialed. Line. We had a, oh, we had a hotline back to the studio and I told him who I was and that my dad and he knew my dad and he put uh-huh. me on the air and I called the end of the world series, the Dodgers winning the world series on a Los Angeles radio station. Wow. Uh, illegal totally yeah, illegal. Yeah, no i mean it sounds illegal so it totally. better be so, but at that station right then a guy is walking through the building and he and he's from another station in riverside right about 60 miles out of, out of la and he pops in a cassette and he records what i'm doing oh he takes it to his boss in riverside they just lost their sportscaster who just moved to to Palm Springs. Oh. And they called me the next day and said, how quickly can you get here? Oh, wow. So that, that phone call by accident, me flipping that switch and hearing the thing. And I was in Riverside within a week uh, doing games in Riverside. Wow. I mean, uh, you know. And, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, I, I was just going to say, it's crazy. It seems like all the greatest, you know, uh, like big breaks that have happened in a person's life have always been by way of coincidence or irony. You know, it's like, it's the craziest thing. I was in Riverside for a short time. Uh, I worked uh, for the Olympics with my godfather uh, who invented instant replay for television. Nice. I finally got into, I got into KNX uh, in 1984, which is the all new station that carried USC games. Mm-hmm. Uh, to do weekend sports mostly. Occasionally, I would do some overnight news mm-hmm. when they needed a fill-in guy. Mm-hmm. And then in 1989, after the 88 season, Tom Kelly decided to take the job at Prime Ticket, which was brand new at the time, right. as the, the lead voice at Prime Ticket. And when that happened, then I was in the spot to, to be able to have a chance. Right. Uh, I, had, I had done not very much yet in my career, although I had done Clippers. I was the first announcer for the Clippers when they moved to go. Los Angeles. So I had that. Yep. Uh, right. Basketball. I'm much better at basketball than I am at football. Oh, oh God. Okay. Much better. Yeah. Cause right. I like the game better. I played the game more. I, yeah, I mean, I, it makes sense, but I mean, it's like everybody knows you for football. So I'm sure they'd find yeah. that a little shocking. Yeah, it's the way, it, the way it is. I, I mean, now uh, I think they're like asking, it's like, well, we want to hear what you sound like with basketball, you know? Yeah, I did plenty. I did plenty. And 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 a letter writing campaign, and it all worked out. I got the job uh, uh, in 1989, and uh, I've been doing the Trojans basically ever since. Well, that I'll tell you, that is probably one of the hilarious, craziest, you know, just plain amazing stories I've ever heard about. You know, somebody getting to a point of you know nowhere to it's like instant fame in a way, or like you know starting a dream of theirs. So. Coincidentally, you know, my father, my father was, uh, uh, he, he went to LACC, got a scholarship to play tennis at Arizona. Oh. Uh, and also played on the radio station at the University of Arizona. Mm-hmm. And a guy, a, can, a, 
a program director from Kansas City, was driving back from L.A. to Kansas City, mm -hmm. heard my dad and his partner's show on the campus station in Tucson mm -hmm. when he was driving through town, stopped at a payphone, called them and said, how quickly can you be in Kansas City? Oh. So it was almost the same kind of thing, right? Where the guys just tooling around the dial on the on yeah. the car radio, yeah. and he heard them. And they were in Kansas City for two years, then yep. they went to Chicago, then they were in New York, yep. then they were in L.A. Yeah, only this one so, wasn't illegal. So, no, no, that that was actually legal, as yeah. far as I know. Yes, yeah. no, I mean, you obviously can't tell for sure, but you know, it's like, whatever. <laughs> it still makes you laugh. Um, so obviously, you know, you just explained in very great detail how you know, you got to this point of, you know, great fame, great success and all that. And part of that fame, of course, has had you be inducted into the Southern California Sports Broadcaster Hall of Fame, which, in, you know, inclu includes, you know, legends beyond compare, like Vince Scully and Chick Hearn, for example, like you mentioned. And I guess, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm sure you could never have imagined that happening. But when it did happen, what did that mean to you? Well, that's a quite an honor yes uh, no doubt about that because <laughs> you're in there with your heroes right uh not just a bunch of guys named joe you know like you said mm -hmm. there's some there's some guys there that are pretty good now yep um i didn't feel like it was undeserved right uh, but but uh it's still uh, amazing to think mm -hmm. back to where it started when i was a little kid right to, to where it is now Mm -hmm. um it's it's uh, yeah. it was in, it was awesome to have that happen to get that phone call right and to have that happen and then you're standing up there right you know the day the day of the induction i'm so nervous of course who uh, isn't because you know when you're on the radio you're talking to one guy or nobody right. it's you talking into a microphone right uh yeah. now there's 250 people in, in the room and you got to give a speech but the 250 people in the room are Keith Jackson and Vin Scully and, right. it's and like, Ross Porter. I'm all, you know, it's these guys. And uh, I'm, I'm in the middle of my speech looking and I, I, I see uh, the owner of the Dodgers, Peter O'Malley. And then I look over and I see uh, Bill McDonald from the Lakers. You, know, all mm -hmm. of, it's, it's, uh, you better not lose your place on the, on the speech. Yep. <laughs> Keep it going. Uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty amazing. I know. I mean, it's, it certainly sounds amazing. I know there are a lot of people in this world who would kill for that chance. So uh, for great. me, at least it feels like a great honor to be talking to somebody from that group. So, you know, again, you know, you know, and the, and the, the, there's, there is one thing about it and I don't put a lot of pressure on myself, but once you're named and everybody knows you're in the hall of fame, you better be good now. Right. Right. Yeah. Now because it's, it's like, now before, it's like, yeah, it's like before, you know, it's like, you don't have to feel the pressure because it's like, well, it's like who the, who the heck's listening anyway. But now it's like, after you're inducted, you're like, Oh, now I know. And yeah. Yeah. Now, now, now they're listening with that critical ear, you know, oh, that guy's not that good. Right. Yeah. You no. better be good now. The pressure's on now. Right. No. Well, it's interesting actually that, you know, you bring up, you know, joining a group that consists of people like Vince Gully and Chick Hearn, for example, because, I thought it would be nice actually for us, you know, cause obviously that, you know, they're not, they're not the only, you know, notable people that you've met or known throughout the years. And I, and I thought actually for our audience, it'd be fun if we could actually play a little game here, um, <clears throat> sort of to honor your contributions, you know, to <laughs> okay. the sports casting, you know, world and just sports world in general. Um, so, the, so the game I have here um, is we're going to call it six degrees of Pete Arbogast. Now, for those who don't know, and I'm sure there are some who don't, based on the concept of the original game of six degrees of separation, and basically what that is, is the belief that any two people on Earth are connected by no more than six people that they know. So like, for example, I know you, for example, and you might know somebody like Sandy Koufax, for example. Sure. And basically sure. that means that I have two degrees of separation, which means right. I know a person who knows him. So I guess I'll actually all start right. with Sandy because we all know he's one of the most well-known uh, Dodgers of all time and most well-acclaimed. You know, he's thrown in a perfect game. You know, he won a World Series. It's like, you know. The best ever. Best right. ever. Left-handed pitcher. Best ever. As far as I'm concerned, best ever. If he yeah. didn't have, if, if he would have been playing now, mm -hmm. I can't imagine how rich he'd be, but he right. also would have been able to fix his arm and he would have pitched forever. Yep. Um, uh, uh, met him once. 
Mm -hmm. uh, was in two pictures with him, though. One, okay. I'm the public address announcer at Dodger Stadium from 1989 to 95. Right. And uh, every, every so often, we'd have an old-timers day. Mm -hmm. And those guys would come back and, you know, yep. I have, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I got a baseball and I'm having them all signed. Right. Please. And we're, none of us are supposed to do that. No, I, right. So, doing it every time. Right. Uh, and uh, so one time I'm sitting, I'm waiting to make an announcement. I'm sitting on the Dodger bench, just mm -hmm. sitting there minding my own business, doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I might've been talking to Don Drysdale because he was on the broadcast team. So I might've mm -hmm. been chatting with him and, yep. and from behind me, uh, Koufax walks up and so now I'm sitting I'm sitting down between the standing Sandy Koufax and the standing Don right. Drysdale talking to each other and I'm just like wow right. this is pretty good so <laughs> I, John, John Suhu the photographer the great photographer took a great picture of that oh. a, a different old timers game I'm back up in the clubhouse right and I'm I came out I thought I might have gone to the restroom and I came out and there's Koufax and he's mm -hmm. coming down the tunnel the same time as me Right. So I introduced myself. He goes, oh, you do a good job here on the PA. And I said, do you, st I just talked to him briefly as we're walking out. I said, do you still get nervous going out there after all this time? He goes, every single time <laughs> uh, I, 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 I get butterflies coming down this ramp every single time, mm -hmm. no matter what old timers game doesn't make yeah. any difference. So well, that, was, uh, that was my whole yep. thing with Sandy. Coke. And well, it's a proving point that, you know, no matter how many times you do something, there's always going to be something that'll keep you at bay in some way, shape or form. It doesn't matter how good yeah. you are or how much other people love you. So I, I think hey, I still get worked up before a broadcast. There you go. Every, every, 10 minutes before the game. Yeah, I'm, no. you know, woo, let's go. Yeah, no. Well, I think actually, um, I, I think that'll kind of lead me into the next person to ask you about, and you've mentioned him several times already, but you know, I think after that many times, people would like to know a little bit more about him personally and your relationship with him. And that's uh, the great Vin Scully who, you know, has, called Dodger games for, I don't know how many years it's ridiculous. You know, I wish he was still calling. I wish he was still calling games, man. I really yeah. do. Uh, pretty good friend. Um, right. and I'll, I'll relay three short stories. One mm -hmm. uh, was when I was the PA guy and I was just starting as the USC announcer. Right. And I didn't really have a phrase to use. And I always thought that using phrases was a, was a crutch. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, he had one that he very seldom used that came from his predecessor, Red Barber. That was a Southern phrase that was used. It's the one you used at the beginning of the broadcast right. today. Uh, how do you do? Which meant, oh, this, this has gone crazy in one right. way or the other. You could inflect it any way you want, make it bad or good. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, I, you use that a lot. Not a lot, but I'd like to use that on right. my broadcast. And he said, Pete, you can have it. I'll never use it again. <laughs> All yours. Oh man. So, so I did. And he hardly ever did. He hardly ever used it. Wow. I've heard him a couple of times. Wow. And you'll hear other announcers, uh, especially Southern guys, Vern Lundquist, a Keith Jackson type of guy. Right. They will, they, they, every once in a while you'll hear that slip out because they're from the South and it's a very Southern phrase. Right. Uh, two, I worked in Cincinnati briefly and I hadn't seen him for a while. Mm -hmm. and uh, I went to the Dodger Reds game and I got a press pass and I went up and said hi in the press box uh -huh. and, and he walked he, he got it was between innings and he got out of his chair came up the stairs of, of the where it's a two-level press box he came up the stairs and gave me a big hug says Pete we missed you in LA so I uh, mean you can't imagine yeah I know yeah I know just great yeah. three I just talked to him on the phone probably mm, three months ago uh -huh. And we're, we're trying hard to his favorite, well, one of his favorite Dodger players, who's not in the Hall of Fame, who should be in the Hall of Fame, uh -huh. uh, Gil Hodges, great first baseman, manager of the Mets who won the World Series in 69, mm, okay. is not in the Hall of Fame for whatever reason. Right. The, the Veterans Committee has been overlooking him. And I thought we could use Vin Scully's gravitas right. in his later years here to, to make a personal plea. Right for the old timers committee to put Gil Hodges in the hall of fame before Ben Scully passes away. I mean, he's right. not a young man no. he's in his nineties. And, and, uh, and Vinny said, I'd be happy to do it. And he, he put a videotape together and sent it to those guys. They were going to vote this year, but they didn't there right. because of the COVID virus. They put right. it off to next year. Let's pray that he, he lasts oh, yeah. that long. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a sad day in LA when that happens. Oh yeah. Uh, 
but but the, when, when I talked to him, I, uh, we we uh, enlisted the help of Tim Mead, who's the president of the Hall of Fame. He used to be the Angels public relations director. We all know him real well, mm -hmm. and so uh, we, we were in cahoots and trying to get this thing together to get Bill right. Hodges into the Hall of Fame. So that's the last time I talked to Vinny. Wow, well, that's. That's, good good that's, friend. I mean, yeah. I can I can call him and he'll take my call. There you go. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's awesome, man. I guess um for my next guy, um, I, I'll shift a little bit from going to guys, you know, who you've met and like, you know, I've always rooted for in your entire life, and actually go to somebody from one of your uh team, one of your favorite teams' biggest opponents in UCLA. Um, although the guy himself is still a great player and coach, actually. Um, and that is uh the great John Wooden. Yeah, I only met him one time uh, when I was with the Clippers. You're always looking for halftime interview subjects. Right. And he happened to be at the game that day. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, I sent my producer down and, and uh, we, we got him to be on our halftime show. I go. don't think I have that on tape. Uh, you know, the Clippers might have that in their archives, right. but I doubt it. I mean, um, it's like they've been so bad forever. They don't want to hold on to their archives. Right, right. That was Those were not good teams. Um, <laughs> And one of the interesting things about John Wooden, uh, as you know, I, I still go up to a YMCA residence camp. You were one of my campers one time. Right. I remember uh, that. And he is, uh, uh, he, he was also a counselor at YMCA resident camp mm. when he was young Wow. and, and was also a ragger, uh, which is a <laughs> YMCA program of, of self-betterment and right. all carried uh, the raggers creed. Uh -huh. in his pocket in, in a folded up piece of paper in his wallet. And we uh -huh. talked about that on, on during that interview because he didn't know I was a writer. I didn't know. I, I did know that he was. Right. And so you find that out about somebody, you, you right. kind of, uh, you share that, that bond with. Oh, them. absolutely. So you know, I didn't I mean, know him very well at all. Yeah. Hey, but I, mean, but I knew like, him better because I knew him right. better because of. Right now. And Hey, it's like, if you can find something like that, you know, you, you should definitely give yourself a pat on the yeah. back. So. Yep. I think that's a, I think that's um, uh, a very interesting way to put it. Um, and I guess actually um, uh, going to basketball, staying with basketball now, I'll go uh, back into uh, both a guy you did talk about earlier and one who didn't, but they're both like still admired both today and in the past they were, um, who both play, uh, worked for the same team in the Lakers. And that's uh, Jerry West and Chick Hearn. Uh, I knew Chick pretty well because uh, mm -hmm. we were, floating in the same circles for seven years while I was doing the right. Clipper games. So we would see each other a lot then. Uh, so he knew who I was. Mm -hmm. and, and again, when I was in Cincinnati, I drove my son Casey up to Cleveland to watch the Lakers play also to Indianapolis uh, to watch yeah. the Lakers play. Uh, Cause we couldn't see him very often. Right. Uh, but, but we drove up to Cleveland and uh, I went down to say hi. And he said, Hey, what are you doing after the game? Uh, why don't you bring your son over and we'll, we'll go out to dinner after the game's over. So, <laughs> Kate, my son, and I, and Chick Hearn, and Stu Lance. We all had dinner together. It was cool. Wow. Okay. That was great. And, uh, oh, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> Jerry's one of the most nervous guys you'll ever meet when it comes to watching a team that he's involved with. Okay. And I was working at KNX doing the sports updates, mm -hmm. but I was also uh, their field reporter. And so the Lakers are playing in the championship series at the forum against the Celtics or right. no, I think it was, I don't remember who it was against. Doesn't yeah, matter. Doesn't we matter. Won. I know <laughs> yeah, we won. that's all that matters. <laughs> so we're standing in the uh, runway at the forum mm -hmm. between the stands and the forum club. Right. And Jerry can't, it's a fourth quarter and I'm standing up there waiting to go into the locker room to get interviews. And he's standing up there cause he can't stand to watch. Right. It's too, it's too much. He can't stand it. So he's, <laughs> He's like peeking around the corner, seeing the scoreboard, and then he'll right. turn around and tell. He's he he knew who I was, right? And I knew who he was, right. he, my favorite player growing up. And right. uh, and he said, Pete, you got to tell me what's going on. <laughs> so basically, I did I did play by play for Jerry West, uh, just him. Yeah, right now. I mean, it's, it's just like if there's, if there's if there's ever one man <laughs> to do a play by play for you, oh, would it's great. hope it would be Jerry West. You know, we ended up winning the winning the game. I don't think it was the clinching game. Uh, I did that a couple times in that series, mm. uh, so that's a great memory. Of, yeah, of Gary no. West. But boy, what a player! I mean, you know, you're the logo. Oh, you, yeah. you're pretty good. 
Yeah, no, I mean, and you know, it's it's weird to hear that the logo can be very shaky sometimes if you look so. Well, he was great on the floor, though. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. And he's great off the floor as, you know, like a manager and stuff. So it's like, you, oh, really oh, have, to, been, you have to appreciate super. everything he's done in regards to the sport of basketball. And, you know, it's, it's I a, wish we would have kept him at the, with the Lakers. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like any person wishes that for a player of his etiquette. So I guess um, I'll go back to um, the Dodgers for a second, although this time I'll actually go for a guy who, uh, unlike the previous guys I mentioned and you've mentioned, uh, did not do announcing, did not play. He actually coached, and I think that's a, a very important topic to cover as well. And that's, uh, you know, the great uh, Tommy Lasorda. You know, rest in peace. It's like sure, Tommy was a big Trojan fan, huge USC fan. He and Rod Dato were close friends, mm-hmm. the SC baseball coach. Um, so when I was the PA announcer, mm-hmm. he knew I was the, play, the the play-by-play guy for SC football, and he would just come and sit. If he knew I was in the dugout right. for a pregame show. He would be out there sitting next to me, chewing my ear off about what <laughs> USC was going to be like that year. Right. That happened all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, in 90, uh, 2004, USC is going to play uh, Oklahoma in the 2005 Orange Bowl for the national championship. Oh, okay. And uh, for the first time in my life, I got to fly on a private jet. One of those <laughs> oh, geez. Ones. It was great. I got invited. I don't know why. Again, right. Whatever. Right. So my wife and I get on the plane and there's a few other people there. And then we turn around and we see the two, the two guests of honor are Rod Dato and Tommy Lasorda. Uh-huh. So we flew all the way from LA to, to Miami. Right. And all we did was listen to those guys. Yep. Tell stories about baseball. And, and they're talking first, first person about Babe Ruth and, and, uh. and about Lou Gehrig, about Mickey, but they're first person stories. I knew this guy, he knew right. Babe Ruth. Yeah, no, you know, the so, great bamboo, great bambino. So, so we're just sitting there with our mouths open, just watching these two guys talk. And he he told me now, uh, SC was, was SC Oklahoma game was supposed to be a really good game, right? Great national championship game. Mm-hmm. And he said, Pete, I'll tell you what, SC is going to kill these guys. They're going to beat them by three touchdowns. <laughs> if they do, you got to you got to credit me on the air. You're going to tell everybody who said it. Nobody yeah. else was saying that. I said, Tommy, come on, yeah. I, I'm telling you, yeah. Man, they did. They give us 55 right. to 20 or whatever. There you go. And we get back on the plane and, and he runs down the stairway. <laughs> and he goes, I told you so. I told you so. Did you give me credit on the air? I said, I sure did. Yeah. No, I mean, it's like if people want, they can listen to the tape. It's right there. He was the old, he was the only guy. That's oh, that my said. goodness. What a great guy. What an ambassador for baseball. Right. Favorite Dodger, you know, him and Vince Scully. Right. Two favorite Dodgers of all time. Oh, absolutely. And they're not even players. You know, it's like, that's the beauty. Part right. Of it all. That's right. You know, it's, it's proof that you don't have to be a player to be loved in sports. You know, you can do other great things. And I guess actually um, that kind of, um, well, it indirectly it does, but I mean, it's like, I, I guess I'll lead into somebody who, you know, he's a, he was a great player and all, but he wasn't necessarily known exactly for what he did on court. Cause one of the things I keep hearing about this guy is that he was probably the only great Laker who never won a championship when he played for them. And that's Elgin Baylor. And I guess, oh. I, and I guess I would ask, you know, what, what experiences did you have with somebody of his etiquette? Well, when I was the play by play announcer for the Clippers, mm-hmm. he was the general manager of the Clippers. Right. And so there was, right. so I did the Elgin Baylor show every game for there the last go. three years. So Elgin and I became pretty good friends because <laughs> we, we, we had to talk about a lot of stuff over the course of three seasons worth right. of 80 games. Uh, I, I think I did 50 games the first year and almost 70 the, the last year. Right. Um, uh, so, you know, another great player. And of course the Lakers, he, he retired the day right, the, the Lakers went the on their 33 game winning streak. They, right. they, they went on the 33 game winning streak, won the championship. I know they gave him a ring and they gave him money, but it would have right. been great to see him out there and right. be part of that. Um, what don't you know about Elgin Baylor? He is a world-class, not just good, a world-class gin rummy player. <laughs> he would, he, if you play that game at all, <laughs> he will kick your butt. He is so good. It's ridiculous. Oh. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> he used to play against me and Gene Shu, the Clipper coach, and Ralph Lawler, and he would just kill us. 
<laughs> world class, world class gin rummy player. Oh my goodness, that is the yeah. funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. And we were trying. I mean, right? We no, no. It's like no you know, chance. If he if he beats you that many times, it's like you get tired of it. Oh. Really try. It's like, and I'm good. I'm okay. I could play, but. Right. I mean, it's just like in plain old sports. It's like you can be really good, but if when you go up against the best, you look like nothing. Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> oh my goodness, that is never. That is a if sticker. he ever says you want to play a little card game, don't. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny as heck. No money. Oh my goodness. Um. Well, that's that's great. Um. I guess I'll go. Um. Uh, back to USC. Actually, I think this is the first guy I mentioned who, you know, actually, you know, b- built his, a lot of his career off of USC. And, you know, obviously that, that's what you're known for a lot of the time. And that's, um, and I'm sure you, and I think you call them too, which makes it even more interesting as uh, uh, Marcus Allen, who, you know, obviously we all know is one of USC's greatest football players and one of the NFL's too. So yeah, like- I did not. I met him a couple times. I, you know, he knows who I am. I know who he is because uh, I see him at functions more than anything. Right. Uh, right. He was, he was a player way before I was, uh, I was a broadcaster. He played back in the late seventies, early eighties. Right. Um, and My he bad. was great. I mean, SC, SC's had a number of great running backs, uh, John Arnett and Garrett, uh, yep. OJ, Charles right. White, Marcus Allen, Reggie yep. Bush. <laughs> They've had some guys <laughs> go on and uh, on, man. Doesn't stop. Yeah, there's some, there, there have been some good ones. Uh, Marcus is, is as smooth as they come. He's a, he's a good man. I, I, I interviewed him once him and OJ at the same time. Oh, wow. Uh, at, at, I was covering a, US, a USC basketball game, women's game at the Pauley Pavilion. Right. The playoffs. And the tennis tournament was going on upstairs. And Marcus and OJ were watching the tennis tournament together. And so I got them together and talked. We just interviewed mm. them real quick. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good guy. Good guy. Good. Well, I'll do a couple more. And the okay. and um, then we'll move on. Um, sure. The next guy I have, and this is interesting, actually, because, you know, at least for you, I think, and for all of us, you know, it's like he's known for a lot of things. And, you know, at the same time, he doesn't have that constant presence, at least to me. And, you know, people can differ if they want. Um, but he was still way, greatly known, ironically that enough, though, for only one accomplishment in, it, in his career. And that was scoring 100 points in one game uh, in, in the NBA. And that is uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Uh, saw him play, of course. Uh, right. um, I got to interview him again with the Clippers. Right. Uh, same thing happened with Eddie Murray. Uh, he said, uh, "We." I sent my producer down and I said, "We'd love to have you on. We'd love to have you on the halftime show." He says, "As long as we don't talk about basketball." <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I had him on, and you've seen the picture right. where I'm interviewing him. I I talked to him about uh, beach volleyball. Because he was oh. a huge beach volleyball player, you'd like to nice. have him on your team. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, he used to play competitive beach volleyball with uh, some guys from UCLA, Keith Erickson, who played for the Lakers for a while, and some other guys who were really, really good. I mean, they won mm-hmm. big time tournaments. And uh, he also he wanted to play in the Olympics, but was a big follower of uh, Olympic volleyball. Right. The Olympic volleyball. And so we talked about volleyball. The Olympics were just coming up in. I right. think it was '88. Yep. And so. We, we talked about the Olympics. We talked about that. And the last question, I, I, I blew him up and said, uh, could you still get out there and play? He goes, I'd kill these guys. <laughs> I would just kill these guys. Right. And that was the end of the interview, pretty much. Uh, yeah. that, was, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I know. I mean, you can only imagine how good of a beach volleyball player he would have been, you know. Oh. If you I mean, ever it- go to, uh, there's a restaurant in Santa Monica called uh, Gilbert's El Indio. Okay. It's a Mexican restaurant. And on the wall, they have pictures of uh, lots of sports teams in the area. And one of them right. is of Wilt's volleyball team. And they're standing. Wow. It's a little, t- little tiny picture, but it's right, right, right. Wow. Pretty cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's a, a giant. I do. Um, uh, this one, I think you, this guy, I think you've met before. Um, and, you know, obviously he's, you know, uh, admired throughout the Lakers franchise because he's one of the biggest reasons why they were so successful for so long. Uh, Jerry Buss. Well, it's the other half of that story I was going to tell you. Right. There you uh, go. I was applying for the Laker job mm-hmm. and uh, I got a call from uh, Jerry Buss's administrative assistant. He says, Jerry Buss would like to meet you. Mm-hmm. Said, oh, great. Maybe I got the job. You know, maybe I'm going to get the job. Big SC fan knows right. who I am, mm-hmm. knows I've been applying for the job. I say, where does he want to meet? He says, mm-hmm. Tommy's hamburgers down downtown. Oh, I know that okay, place. Great. 
all right, I'll go there anytime. So I meet him. He's dressed like he always is, kind of, you know, just blue jeans and a polo shirt. Mm -hmm. And he, he, uh, he said, Pete, uh, I love what you do on the air. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a great broadcaster for USC, and I'm a big USC fan, as you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's the reason I am not going to hire you to be the voice of the Lakers. Oh, Mm. He says, I enjoy you so much being on right. the air as USC's voice, and I want to continue to hear you, and you can't do that. If you're the voice of the Lakers, I'm not going to let you keep being the voice of the Trojans at the same time. Wow. And so that's why I am I wanted to let you know in person. That's why I'm mm. not going to hire you. And I was like, thanks, I guess. Yeah, no, it's like you don't know how to feel from that response. You're like, hey, you know, at least I know why, and I feel yeah. good about that. But it's like, come on, I right. wanted to be the freaking, you know, sports yeah. announcer for the Lakers. It's like, come yeah. on, man. You know, if you like me so much, why don't you reward me? That's going to be in my book. That story's in my yep. book. No, I, I, been... I'm just finishing that book up, and it hopefully it'll be out later on this year. Well, I will say this for sure. I will be first in line to get it. You know, because I'm very intrigued. I'll autograph it. I'll autograph a copy for it. Thank you, man. I I, I appreciate that. You know, <laughs> and then I'll sell it off for a ton of money. I'm just kidding. You know. Right. No. Hey. I think now we'll go into a little more of the more personal aspect of you that a lot of people don't know as much that I know a little bit of, but still don't know everything, which is why you're here. Um, but before that, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, one of our sponsors. Do you own a classic Mustang, Corvette, Camaro, or Chevelle from the 1960s or 70s? Does the clock in your dash keep accurate time? Do you want to get a new clock for your car, but you don't want to pay $200, $300, or even $500 for a new clock? Well, then go to impactautopartsstore.com for a brand new quartz clock that looks identical to the original and is powered by a single AA battery. All at prices less than half that of a restored clock or a reproduction. Go to the website, impactautopartsstore.com, and keep on cruising. I mentioned this last uh, during the last episode, but for our audience who didn't watch that, I'll remind them. One of the reasons I, well, the actually the only reason I know Pete so well is because for, you know, I think like eight, seven or eight years, you were, and you also were the founder of this all, you founded the Santa Monica YMCA Basketball League, which I myself was a part of for the first seven, seven years myself. And I was, pro and at the same time, I was the only person who stuck around for that long, which is why we got to know each other so well. And of, of course, the reason I stuck around so, for so long was because that league meant so much to me and all. And, you know, I liked being a part of that experience and, you know, getting to play some, a sport I loved and, you know, having somebody like you running it, you know, made it all the more enjoyable, you know, cause you were very good at keeping stats, you know, and making, and generally making it feel like, you know, something real, something, you know, to like, something to enjoy and just, you know, uh, sort of serve as a place where, you know, I could be myself basically and, you know, be the kind of person that I like most about, you know, about, you know, playing sports and whatnot and playing basketball and stuff. And side story, actually, too, you were um, responsible for some of the biggest things uh, in my life, in my sports life in terms of like, uh, you know, uh, like pop culture and stuff. Like, for example, one of the nicknames I remember you gave me uh, after I had a really big game, uh, you know, knocking down threes, you gave me the nickname three again. And, you know, for oh, the longest, good. yep. And for the <laughs> longest time, I kept that with me, even though granted my three point shooting is lagged behind, you know, it's like, it still sticks there. And it's like, I have you to thank for that. So thank you, man. You know, I remember. <laughs> that's a good name. Like yeah, no. I, and it was your idea, man. I remember I didn't even mention it. And, and when, when you gave it to me, I was like, that's brilliant, you know? And it's like, it's stuck, you know? And I took full advantage of that. And ironically enough, that came, or the, the place I found out about that is, is in a place called The Hoop. And for those who don't know what The Hoop is, for the longest time, you know, when you were running the league or when Pete was running the league, he wrote after every week of games, he wrote an article describing what happened in the games as if it were like, you know, your average NBA game or whatever that you, you know, missed and wanted to hear a recap of. And it's like, it really fit well. And believe it or not, you did such a good job uh, that I actually framed one of those articles that had my first uh -oh. appearance. And I'd like to quickly read what it says here. And I think this is actually a perfect, um, like sort of uh, like, uh, example of why you're so good at what you do, both as a sports announcer for USC and as a writer here, basically, you know, you know, putting out these art newsletters every week and stuff. So 
uh, here's a quote. Um, With his team trailing 16-14 and time running out, Keegan Flegner of the Wildcats drove the baseline only to be confronted by the Waves' 5'10 Trent Shorter, who had already who already had swatted away seven previous Cats attempts. Not thrilled about the prospect of being number eight, Flegner weighed his option and tossed the ball behind him to the hot hand of Joe Reed, who drilled a 10-footer with just six seconds remaining to tie the game. And I think, you know, again, that says it all right there in terms of how you know, as a sports announcer and a sports writer, one of the toughest things you need to do is make, you know, these seemingly ordinary things seem ex- extraordinary, basically, you know, and it's like, I know, as if you've been doing this forever, it's like, you'll always have the, those occasional moments where you don't, it doesn't need, you don't need to do much to make it as extraordinary as it is. But, you know, majority of the time, and I'm sure you would agree, it's like, you're just describing things like incomplete pass, you know, out of bounds, turnover, stuff like that. And, you know, as a sports announcer and as a writer, it's your job to make those kinds of things, you know, stick out in the most extraordinary way possible, no matter how ordinary they might seem on paper, you know? Going back to Monty Moore in Porterville, and he told us he would break down our tapes after the game and tell us there's 33 ways to say that shot was missed. Right. And he would make he would make us list them and then start going through them. So you don't want to say no good every time you want to, you know, the iron clank to the left, whatever Mm -hmm. it is. Right. uh, Or the shot is good or the pass is made or the run is good. So you you want to you want you don't want to be repetitive. My goal in that that league was a dead fish. It had been in operation for forever. Right. At the Y. But for the for the few years before I got there, it had it had died a gruesome death and was there was nobody there. And my boss said, can you run a basketball league? And mm-hmm. you know, that's all I've done for my, I, I have either coached or played right. or refereed yep. my entire life. Right. And, and I've run leagues before for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, I could do that. Yeah. Um, I wanted, we started with, like you said, four kids and, and about 20 players, four teams and 20 players. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I still remember that, three. you know, yeah. I, thought, there was, there I still actually have, on. I still actually yeah. have the Jersey from that first team I was on. There were occasions where we would have to cross pollinate because one team didn't have enough kids. And right. so somebody from the other team would play with them when that's mm-hmm. just what you had to do. Yep. And I would go out to the local schools and, and the newspapers and the parks and recs and put up flyers and do everything I could. And eventually within a couple of years, we, we had yep. a full boat of 30 teams and 300 kids. Um, mm-hmm. My goal uh, was to give everybody the full experience mm-hmm. of being, uh, we treated it like you, like you said, we treat you like you're in the NBA. You're going to get a write up. You're going to get box right. scores. You're going to get standings and stats. Everybody gets awards. Yep. Some people get bigger awards than other people. There's an MVP. There's <laughs> yep. a most inspirational. There's a right. most everything. everything. We did right. it all. Yeah. And, and, and um, we had junior referees. You were right. in that program. Yeah, I remember uh, that. As a kid, refereeing younger kids' games. I did right. that in junior high. It's right. frightening when you start yep. trying to be a ref. The first time, you, you, you don't even want to blow the whistle. You don't even really want to be there. <laughs> yep. But it gets better. Mm-hmm. Um, junior coaches. I don't know if you ever coached, but we had a bunch of kids yeah. come down and coach in the, in, the ba- in the minor, in the very smaller leagues mm-hmm. uh, to get their feet wet to see if they wanted to try to do that. People right. were running the scoreboard for me. I did that. Um, we yeah, all the time. We had people writing their own stories about games. Kids were writing their own stories about games and giving them to me, and I would put them in the in the paper and just give them the byline by Joe Reed. There you go. It was. I don't even remember Joe Reed. I should, but I don't. I don't <laughs> Neither know. do I, man. You know, don't worry. I was don't feel kids over eight years, so it's you know whatever. The whole experience, I think, was really important for everybody to feel like they were involved in something special. Now, some of that. Right is my undiagnosed obsessive compulsive disorder. I clearly, uh, especially when it came to stats, right? Uh, you know, keeping re- rebounds and assists and steals and block right. shots and and every possible. I mean, statistic. it's why you were so good at it too. It's like you were just genuinely well, obsessed. Yeah, that. But yeah, it's an illness. But at least it came out in a good way. Yes. No. It's like that's what I'm trying to do with this. I'm trying and to. It explain. serves me well, Keegan. It serves me well in my broadcasting career too, because my preparation for a game is so uh, succinct. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I I put down more stuff on a on a couple of pieces of paper than than you would possibly use in a game. But right. I never know what part I'm going to use in a game, so I have to have it all ready to go. And, right. And. Uh, yeah, no. It's, 
that's yeah. part of that OCD that I probably have. Right. And I mean, <laughs> I think it's fair to say, I think it's fair to say that I do have. Yeah, no, I mean, the, listen, the fact that you even realize that, you know, shows just why, how, and how much, how clear and how helpful it really is. Because if you, if you, even if it's not, yeah. you know, you know, perfectly clear, it's like the fact that you might have an idea that you might have it. It's like that can help pay huge dividends when you're doing something like this, you know? Right. Right. And going back to your point about, you know, how everybody felt involved and, you know, had their stats and all and got awards, some got bigger awards. I think for me, that was, you know, part of the reason why I sticked around so long, because, you know, you and me both can agree. I was never that standout player. It's like, you know, I mean, there were moments, you but it was pretty good now. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I wasn't, I was no scrub obviously. And I, and I had skills, no. but at the same time, no. I was never necessarily like at the very top echelon of players. Like there was always some guy who was better than me in some way, shape or form. And they always got, and as a result, they always got usually the top tier recognition. Like I would, I would normally like get first team and stuff, but you know, that, that list was huge. So it's like, at the hey, same, first team was pretty good. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, I appreciated it, but at the same time it was, like there were moments, you know, and after you do this for so long, there are moments where you're like, wow, can I really make a shot at this finally? You know, I had those moments and I will happily admit them, you know, and it's. And you, it's, were, you were player of the game more than more than once for right. sure. But, but I mean, again, it's like, you know, compared to cer some other guys who were not in the league, league nearly as long, they were, you know, con consistent right. appearances. And for me, it was like. They would come and go. Right. A guy, a guy like uh, a guy like Sammy Cohn or Dash Decker, those guys would come into the league. They'd be too right. good for the league. I'd right. let them and play leave. for a season or two, and then I'd kick them out right. to go play travel ball. This is a yeah. rec league. Right. I mean, you don't want a guy scoring 45 points a game in a rec no. league. You, yeah, that's you no want everybody scoring 20. My goal, my hope is that a right. few guys at the end of the year right. would go play for their team. Right. Uh, on the boys' side, it's much harder than it is for the girls' side. Most right. of the girls that played in our league and yeah. played against boys would right. play in high school ball and almost right. all the girls that wanted yeah. to play high school. Ball. Yeah. And, and, and the other good thing about our league, I thought was intergenerational. The younger mm -hmm. kid, if you were a nine-year-old and you were great, right. Well, you weren't playing nine-year-olds. I was moving you up to play right. against the 11. You know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like that. And there you get the lesson. And, and it's funny, actually, you mentioned how with the girls, it was a lot easier because you know, the, the truth of the matter is a lot more girls. You're right. You know, we're able to get on their high school um, yeah. varsity team and stuff and do that. And I actually have another picture here that shows you with four of, you know, arguably the best play. Uh, Those yeah, are great players. These Caitlin are Cook, of, Rachel Kim. Right. Yeah, uh, no, these uh, are Adrian arguably. Schroer. Right. Yep. These are arguably four of the best girls players to come through. And they all made their high school varsity team. And so, you know. Had there been a team this year at Santa Monica High School, right. Rachel would have been the starting point guard on the varsity team. There you go. You know, it, it just speaks to how, you know, like you said, with the girls, it's a lot easier for them to. And I think actually that might have been a, a big benefit of this league. You know, this league allowed girls to almost equally, if not, you know, well, sure. uh, more so succeed just because they, you know, they had a place where they could play against boys and, you know, learn these skills and all, and, you know, take right. that with them. And when they went to play with other girls, it's like compared to them, they were really good. You know, you played against Rachel. She would never back down. No. Nope. And she was tough, man. She yeah. was a tough opponent and you'd love to have her on your team. Absolutely. You know, you know, my dad, uh, who was my, uh, if our viewers don't know, was my coach for years. It's like, he always wanted to have Rachel on his team, you know? Yeah, yes, of how smart, tough she was. coachable, tough, yep. all those things. And the, you know, and the other thing we tried to do that we don't, I didn't mention that's not basketball related, right? It, because it was the YMCA, but even if it wasn't, I would try to do this is yeah. to make sure that our coaches and our refs and our opponents and our fans and our players are all on the same page mm -hmm. that we're all trying to be good sports, right? Always and good sports in all ways, right? But also use basketball as a teaching tool mm -hmm. to become better human beings. Absolutely. And we did that in basketball and I did that up at mountain camp as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I actually have a couple more pictures to kind of uh, give our audience more of a picture of what exactly happened. So right here, I have actually a picture of you with just some random kid, you know, and you're yeah. taking stats. She's shooting a free throw or he, I'm not even sure. We had a free throw contest uh, yep. all year long and kids that didn't score in a game. Right. They didn't score any points. 
got to shoot a free throw, some free throws at the end of the game. Yep. It just, and we gave away again, a nice award at the end of the year. Yep. Perfect example to how, even if you weren't great, you still had a, a place in this league, you know, it was yeah, yeah. that simple. And then going back to my uh, point about awards one more time, while I wasn't necessarily that kid who got the flashy awards all the time, I did end up getting what I considered to be our, and I'm sure you would agree, maybe that probably the highest honor you could, you know, achieve in this league and is at this moment, it's not shared with many other people. Rachel happens to be one of them. And my dad does too. And Matthias, who I mentioned last week does as well. And that is being inducted into the hall of fame. And this yep. right here that I'm showing you is a picture of me with you holding that plaque right after I was inducted. It's and about, I, uh, it was about longevity being there right. for a long time but also being the kind of human being, not a great basket, a good basketball player. Right. You had to be a good player. Right. But you also had to be a good human being. Right. And if you didn't have all, all of those things, longevity, good human being, good basketball player, there's no way you get in the hall of fame. Right. You know, it's, it's the simple truth. And I, and I recognize, and I recognize that one, when I found out I was going to be inducted, I was like, well, this is the reason why. And I appreciated that at the same time, you know, Cause I mean, for me, it's like being in the league for as long as I was, you know, and, and your pop too. Same right. Thing. Yeah. No, same thing. And, and look, same with, look, same with you, Matthias and Rachel. We all grew in this league. We were, right. we were rough edged when we started it and your dad will fully admit this. Right. Uh, and by the time we were done, we had turned the page and become different people mm -hmm. the way we coached. Yep. The, the things we said, the, the support of other teams, all these things, we, we transformed. Our, I did too. I, was, yep. uh, I had a bad temper. I, I lashed out at your dad a couple of times. For sure. I remember that. Yeah. And, and, but I learned to, by being in this league and getting to know everybody and doing them, and I really worked on those things like you did with your, your cases and your dad did with his and so many Matthias did with his. Right. Everybody worked on their stuff and became better people. Yeah. And it was interesting too, because when I, at the same time, when I was inducted, that was the same year you chose to retire from the league. And so I think it was a, it was a good um, showing of how full circle everything had come. Although granted the league is still going and it's still very strong, but you know, I think it, it kind of served as a good ending point in that regard, you know, and, and I, I felt really Paul happy Drew, about it. Paul Drew has done a really nice job. Yes, he does. Yes, he has. Uh, and, 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 and has the newsletter going and the league is still, that was my, you know, I've been in these situations before where you leave and it just falls apart. Right. And I wanted to make sure that we gave it to somebody that knew what the heck they were doing. Absolutely. And you tell that guy, do the same for the next guy. So you want to bring somebody in that's really tuned in on what we're trying to do. And Absolutely. Keep it, going. If we keep it going. That's another generation of kids that's going to get it. Absolutely. And it's also interesting that either you or me, we both um, have brought up Matthias and Jim, who, like I said, share the rare honor with me and Rachel being part of that hall of fame. And I actually have quotes from both of them about what they think of you. And I just like to read them for oh, you. God. So no. this one, this one's from Matthias. So a uh, quote, okay. Peter is one of the most influential people in my life. He has served as a mentor and father figure to me over the last 10 years. His wealth of knowledge and history with sports and sports figures is an inspiration, not only to me, but also countless people young and old across this country. I only wish my only wish is that I had met him earlier in my life. Well, other than being a Yankee fan, I love the guy. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. If, again, for our viewers who um, watched uh, the previous episode, they know, in fact, that he is a, yeah. a good Yankee He's fan. gone up to camp with us a bunch, too, and become yep. a different person as he has progressed. There you go. Uh, yeah. And for those, and by the way, for, for those of us who, ha for our audience who has not watched the previous episode, go watch that right now and you'll see yeah, what we're talking sure. about. You know, he's a great guy. And, you know, if you watch the previous episode, really interesting story. We'll see why. Yeah, no. And then I um, also have this uh, quote from Jim, who, like our audience should know, is, was also a great coach for years and is, as a result was part of the fame, Hall of Fame, too. And he said, quote, what always struck me about Pete was his ability to balance and cater to so many audiences, whether it was players, coaches, parents, referees, wide administration, and many more. I'll always remember Pete behind the scoreboard keeping stats for every game and then publishing a weekly newsletter called the hoop, as I just mentioned earlier, something that brought tremendous joy to every player. Pete did it all as a dad. I always felt that Pete took a special interest in Keegan, but then again, I think he took a special interest in every kid who was in the, in his program. 
that was Pete's magic. Well, that's very nice to hear. Uh, yeah. you know, we're, we're trying to raise these kids as a group. Uh, there's a, uh, like, like uh, it's been said, it takes a village and mm -hmm. we're all in this together. Absolutely. Uh, I still referee, although they're not playing right now because of the virus. And I hope you come back and referee still. Absolutely. It's fun. You know. It's, you know, 10 bucks a game too. That right. Yeah, I know. It's like, I definitely think <laughs> once this pandemic is over with and yeah. the opportunities start coming back, I will happily take up the chance because, you know, again, I love that league, love this league forever. And, you know, I, I think I feel like it would be the least I would do to give back. So, you know, I guess um, uh, building off of that, I'll, Fire off a couple questions here at once. I, I, I guess my only ask would be you try to keep track of them. Uh, so, and, and you've partially also answered them again. This is just to get some more additional info out of your mm -hmm. mouth. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, basically, how did you first get involved with this league? Like, and why did you choose to do it too? Like, what did you see in it that made you think this was something, you know, worthwhile, basically? And then also, were there any, once it got started and all, and you started, you know, uh, work, um, you know, putting it all together, you know, were there any specific moments that stuck out to you? And also just why do you feel it became so successful too, so quickly? Uh, I had already, in every stop for my entire life, I've worked for the YMCA in one fashion or another. Mm -hmm. uh, the first game I coached was uh, when I was in seventh grade in 1967, which was the first year of junior high then. Right. Um, and a YMCA league where mm -hmm. it was school. The old Y leagues used to be school against school, like the Crest program right. in Santa Monica is now. Right. It used to be YMCA run instead mm -hmm. instead of Parks and Rec. Right. Um, so the, the Y now is a, is a rec league. Anyway, I did that. And then I became a, a, a camp. I was a camper at mountain camp and at day camp and a camp counselor. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and then in many later years became a, a director of that, that sports league. Right. I also became an assistant director and a director of day camp and mountain camp. So I moved mm -hmm. up the ladder of the YMCA. Um, but because of my broadcast career, <clears throat> there was only a, there were only a couple of times where I had a chance to flip and become a professional in the YMCA program. Right. Uh, I could have been a program director or and moved up the ranks in the YMCA and, and become an executive there instead. Mm -hmm. But I I really really. Uh, wanted to be what I am in, in radio. So yep. the way to balance that is to continue to come back and give to the Y. Right. Most of the time that only I would be in Porterville in Central right. California and I would go to the Visalia YMCA, which is next door. Right. And say, I want to, I want to work mountain camp for a week with mm -hmm. you. And they were happy to have me because I gave them all my experience. And right. Great. Did the same thing in Riverside. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came back to LA, I went to Santa Clarita, did the same thing there. When I moved to Santa Monica, Venice, right. uh, I, I hooked up, I again, hooked up with the Santa Monica YMCA, went to mountain camp first. Mm -hmm. That's where I met my boss who's, who had the opening for this, this right. program and said, would you like to take this over? I wasn't doing USC basketball. I was only doing football. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was working at a radio state. I wasn't working at a radio station at the time right. at all. Uh, mm -hmm. All the radio jobs had dried up. And, and so I, I uh, needed the work, really. Right. And it filled the day. And so I did it. It, mm -hmm. didn't, it doesn't pay great, but right. it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can't make a living doing it. No. Something like that. But, you know. Uh, but very few people at the YMCA do. Right. Um, and, and so I took it on. In the middle of it, there was a, another all-sports radio station that came on in L.A., and I did work for them part-time, mm -hmm. which made it a little, diffi a little difficult. Yeah. Uh, but not that much. Right. Um, so that's how I got involved. Um, right. uh, she asked, I said, yes. And I took it, I took the reins. She said, do whatever you need. Here's your budget. Go right. for it. Yeah. And, and the budget, the budget grew exponentially with right. the number of kids in the program. We had right. more money. And so I got bigger budget to buy more uniforms or whatever. I'd build. Of course, more basketballs, whatever I needed. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the sec second half of that question was, uh, why did, uh, or were there any moments in particular once it started oh. getting going that stuck out? And why do you think? Yeah, it no, not really. It was just tough to start. It was hard <laughs> to get it started because yep. because people were doing other things at other places. So you had to steal people from right those other organizations. Yeah, Boys and Girls Club, Parks and Rec. Right. But, or people that weren't playing at all. Right. You had, to, you had to find you had to find these people and get them to come in. And the number one reason it was successful, number one, 
mm-hmm. is because the coaches and the parents bought into what we were trying to do. Right. I hardly, very rarely, very right. rarely had problems right. where you have to boot somebody out of the gym or you right. have to. Yeah, every once in a while there's a technical foul called and that yep. sets the tone and you explain to the kid or the coach or the parent why this was called and if you do it again we're gonna we're gonna throw you out of the game right. and we don't want you here we don't want your type here if you do that right here's what we do want right and we would explain exactly how we want you to act right if you can't do it go play boys and girls club go play parks and rec do whatever right. you want here this is the way we're going to do it and the parents and the coaches bought right. in and when they bought in the kids bought in right not all of them right not all of them we had problem kids we yep. had athletes who, who thought they were better than this mm-hmm. and and we had to train them to, right to, to fit in our system to fit in our program right and that's the case in that's the case in at camp up in the mountains that's yep. the case the case at work when you go to work right everywhere you go you're going to see you're going to have to fit in right what they want to do. right and they did and the parents yeah. the parents are the ones that are responsible yeah i'll take some responsibility for that i'll take some praise for that because it started with me but it starts right. with the why it of started with me then i then i filter it down to the coaches the coaches filter it out to their parents yep Ta-da. there we there go. go well i'll say this you uh i was not one of the people you had to buy me into i was bought in from the start and i, yeah, and I remember yeah. I remember how much I loved it. And I guess at the same time too, going back to that behavior thing, I think part of the reason I was able to stay in the league so long was because I never really, and nor did my, my mom or my dad or anybody I knew personally, it's like, did they have a bad, did they not agree necessarily with the attitude or the behavior standards of that thing? You know, cause that was what they, they wanted to take away both them and me, you know? Well, you had your challenges, right? Thus the name of this, this podcast, right? Uh, there are other kids that had their challenges that were way different than yours. Right. Uh, people are going through divorces, people that are going through right. um, poverty, right. uh, people that are going through a death in their family of a parent. Right. Uh, there are anger issues. Right. Um, and there are other kids. I remember a kid who was, I mean, I don't know. I'm not trained in, in recognition. Uh, mm-hmm. They don't train us for this stuff. Yeah. Recognizing. Um, like a kid had a palsy condition of some sort mm-hmm. and he was missing a hand. His Ooh. hand, it didn't work. It was a little kid, eight year old, maybe right. Little kid, happy as a clam, you know, great kid. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, but, but he learned how to dribble with his other hand and pick it up like, and shoot it. And he could shoot the kid could drop him. now. Uh, so we had all kinds of different issues, psychological issues, physical issues, right. all kinds of stuff. Yeah. To deal with all the time, but we just did. We yep. just do. Yep. No. And I, like I said, I wasn't trained and you and I went to camp together. Right. You know, you want me, want me to tell the story? I, I, I yeah, sure. Go ahead, man. It's, it's like, okay. I'm, I'm, exp- it's, it's I'm long, exposed enough as is, man. Just do it. It's you know? a long time ago now. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I knew that you were on the autism spectrum. Right. Uh, I didn't know where that would take us. Right. And, and and we were friends and we hung, you know, we yeah, talked no, a lot. I mean, we, we knew each fine. other. It's like, yeah, we're fine. I was comfortable with you. And I think you were comfortable with me. Yeah. No, and I was your camp. I was your camp counselor and you were in a group with what well, we had eight or nine other guys. Yeah. And I knew most all of them, the same so. age. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we all, we're all from the Y league, I think, weren't we? Yeah. No, it was all I think players so. from the Y. Yeah. All right. And uh, we get in the cabin, right. Now we're in the mountains. It's, it's dirty. And all we right. cleaned it. We clean and clean and clean and scrape right. and do whatever, but still, right? Yeah, it's in the mountains. It's dirty, and there are bugs. And the first night, <laughs> Keegan's like, "I can't, I can't sleep here. Yeah. I, I can't. I got. I got to go home." I say, Keegan, we, we're not. You can't go. Right. Home. You're not going home. There's nowhere to go. There's no bus. There's no car. And your parents are home. So it was a tough first night for you. As I, I remember that night. Were, I remember had an I... issue with. Dirt and bugs, I think. With I didn't have an issue there. with dirt. I had an issue with bugs. Oh. Yeah. Oh, well, and there were plenty of them. Yeah. There were plenty of them. Yep. But yeah. we yep. we figured it out and yeah. we got through it. Yeah. No. And uh, you know, God bless you for doing it. Uh, yeah. No, and no. I think the rest yep. of the week, slowly but surely, got better as we went. Yeah. Along. No, it did. It did. Once I was able to finally s- calm myself down, settle in, yeah. and 
I also did indirectly fix the bug problem. That was kind of by ignoring it, but also I found a good place where there weren't as many and I just like, you know, let it go and all that stuff and it worked word out. Word as many, that's word as many is a key phrase there. Right. There are a lot of bugs. Yeah, there. right. Exactly. And, and you know what? And I thought the guy, we talked to the guys in our group right? who all knew you and we all knew each other. We talked to the guys because they were kind of getting, they didn't know about right. you. They, they were, right. so they were freaking out a little bit about it. I said, boys, so what here's here's the story right and we talked about it out we got it out in the open and we talked about it right and from then on they were great they never yeah. bothered you again no. no they were great cabin mates you know i i never yeah, dislike them you know and it's like I, I still talk with some of them you know it's like so it's it's like i i still hold that bond in a way um it was, it was a great great moment in, in camping history <laughs> absolutely and i guess actually that leads pretty well actually into my next question which is that um you know, obviously, you know, because you've done all this, you know, uh, running this league and being a camp counselor, it's like you've had a lot, a lot of interactions with these kids, myself included. And I'd like to ask, what influence has that had on you, you know, interacting with these kids? Well, uh, and, and I'll say this, uh, it feeds into coaching as well. And right. I've coached a billion games mm -hmm. um, in every sport. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of my one of my favorite teams was a girls team. Uh, my daughter played on my youngest daughter played on from third grade to ninth grade. Okay. Uh, we were a travel team. We played 150, 200 games a year. Right. Uh, we were really good. Good. Team. Right. Good kids. Not all the same kids came from right. different economic backgrounds and right, right, different right. houses, and different parents and all that. You have to teach the mm -hmm. game the same way because everybody has to learn the plays the same way. Right. But you can't, each each kid the same way right so i had a young girl that you could you could get in her face in her dish and right. and that was what motivated her mm -hmm. to work hard i yep. don't think she hated me i think she just yeah. wanted to show me that she could do it right and so that fired her up i had another girl you had to take her off to the side and talk to her quietly and you could mm -hmm. talk to her sternly but quietly mm -hmm. and there was another girl you could barely whisper to and she'd start crying Yep. So you got you got to be really careful with yep. the different psychological profiles of each of these kids. Right. And that's what happens when you're running a league in terms of coaches, parents, yep. and players, and right. fans, right, uh, and administrators that you right. asked about. They're all different. Be man, you got to treat them all differently. Yep. And but you have to make them all come together as a mm -hmm. group, and that is one of the most fun and enriching challenges yep. of being an administrator of a league or being a coach in a league. Mm -hmm. That's that's if you can make that work right. into a championship team or program yep. or like our cabin, a championship right. cabin, right. If you can do that. You win because then yeah. you have nothing but fun and good times. There you go. It's, it's the, perfect. And that's the hardest part. That's the hardest part with <laughs> yep. a screaming kid or an angry kid or a kid that's on the spectrum you got to treat everybody like they need to be treated. Right. Absolutely. You know, and it truly really is the winning formula at the end of the day. So I think that's uh, very important to remember. All right. So I think now we're finally going to focus a little more on that spectrum aspect that, you know, we've avoided a little, but also have, like referenced and all, I think we're going to get a little more in depth to that. But before we do, I'd like to give a shout out to another one of our sponsors. Are you looking to boost your SAT score by at least 360 points? Whether your goal is the SAT, ACT, AP classes, or general test preparation, turn to Sam's Tutoring Company. Sam is a Caltech-educated tutor with over 17 years of experience teaching over 700 students of all ages. Whether you want to learn in person or remotely, Sam is ready to help you accomplish your academic goals. Call Sam's Tutoring Company. If you mention the promo code SPORTSPECTRUM, you'll receive 25% off the price of your first session. And so with that, I think now... Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. Hang on. Be behind you. Behind I me? I see behind you right now where uh -huh. you're sitting. Turn around Turn around and look at that, that cupboard right there. Are yeah. those all of your jerseys from all of the teams you ever played on? You mean that? Where yeah, I... or is that just your... Uh, it's a mix, I think. It's a mix, okay. I think. So okay, I think there are, you, I think there are some, and like I all said, all the jerseys, like actually all the jerseys that I ever had and my kids ever had. I see all your trophies up there. Check this out. Right. Uh, right. 
Remember when that I mentioned C too? That that's yeah. with the oh well, who's that guy we kicked out of the league? I Chuck. forget his name. Chuck. <laughs> yeah, well, he took it a little too seriously. Perhaps. Yes, I liked him, but um, you know, I get why you he wasn't you know necessarily yeah. fit. He, he tried to get me fired. Other than that, he was great. Yeah. Um, uh, I took all my kids' uh, jerseys. Yep. And uh, we sent them to a company and had them made into a quilt for their bed. Uh, oh, nice. Oh, it was great. 400 bucks. And nice. Yeah, I sleep, sleep with it all the time. All right. Yep. Never mind. All right. Um, so I'll start off with. Um, that should be another sponsor. There you go. <laughs> I'll start off with um, a question I'm sure you've heard me say before. And all my audience, I'm sure, has heard me say before. And um, that's about the term mental health. And I'll just get right into it right away and not drag on about it. But um. What pops into your head when you hear that phrase? Well, both sides, both sides of it, really. Right. Whether it's healthy mental health or unhealthy mental health. Right. You, I think it's the ability to deal with or not mm-hmm. whatever comes your way in a way that uh, mm-hmm. doesn't overwhelm you. So right. You can, you can continue to function. Mm-hmm. And, and, and uh, I, either, either way. Either way. Right. Yeah. That's no. the first thing that I think about. Okay. Yeah. And, and I guess I'll, I'll go into the second question with a little bit of salt or whatever. I don't even know what to call it. Um, so obviously, you know, you're, I'm not going to say you're special, but you are in a sense, or um, because you've interacted with a lot of, you know, people and players and, you know, broadcasters and stuff who are, have become very successful over the years. You know, we did a whole thing about that earlier. And I guess I'd like to ask, you know, what do you, you know, because obviously it's become clear over recent years that more and more of these people are starting to become more open about what they deal with in this regard of, you know, either being on the spectrum or having issues with their mental health or developmental challenges or whatever. And I, and I guess I, I want to ask, you know, what do you make of that trend and why do you think it's happening now, basically, uh, with, you know, these kinds of people specifically? easier to be more open about things these days than it was 20 years ago, even, mm-hmm. uh, which is a good thing. You know, communication right. is the key to being successful in any, uh, in any walk of life or relationship, communicate uh, and let everybody know what's going on so that they right. know what's going on with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of it. I don't hear about a lot of it mm-hmm. in, in, in with teams that, that I cover Right. Uh, generally, you read about it in the paper every once in a while, something will come right. out. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I used to talk to the SC team dentist and he would tell me how scared the big linebackers were of getting a Novocaine shot. You know, yeah. these big giant NFL guys uh, that, that, that hated going to the doctor. Right. Uh, so every, everybody's got their issues, dude. Right. Everybody's every, I got my issues. Yeah. I work on them every single day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and and if I can help uh, other people do the same thing, that's that's. Uh, you know, we all got to get along. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's the idea. But I, I, I think it's great that people can open up and talk about it now. Oh yeah, you know, I, I totally think this. It's not, is a, it's not a thing. It's not a big deal anymore. No, and that, and that is honestly a very good thing. I think you know, because I think it's yeah. gonna make this stuff a lot easier to both talk about and learn about too at the same time. And it'll, I think it'll make everybody better as a result. And I guess it kind of also leads into my following question, which is that um. You know, obviously, in addition to these famous, p- notable people that you've met over the years, you know, you still interact with all these other people, like the people at the Y and stuff who, you know, are just mm-hmm. average Andes or whatever. And, you know, it's like, I, I what I'm asking is like, I, I'm sure you've had experiences where you've come across, you know, these people who, you know, you see who maybe they don't know they have a, a, an issue or whatever, or have a challenge or whatever. And maybe you see that in them before they do. And I guess what I would ask is uh, why did that stick out to you or how did that stick out to you? And also it's like, too, if maybe uh, like at the same time, while they, it was clear they had something, they were still great. Why do you think they were great or maybe even bad, you know, other way around too. I had to deal with some individual kids, uh, but the best way we did it was to talk to the coaches ahead of time and say, coaches, warn your team Mm -hmm. about this kid on the other team Mm -hmm. and what they're like so that they're expecting it. Right. This is coming up. Right. Uh, Don't lash out. Don't fight back. Don't yell back and just, Mm -hmm. you know, help them. What, what, one of our most important things was helping another guy up on the other team off the floor. Right. 
simple act. You don't see that very often in the NBA or no. college ball. Right. It doesn't take much to do that. Right. Uh, but we would have to deal deal with people all the time. I'm sure you'll remember it. there was a guy in our league who, um, who was uh, different, a little interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, don't, you'll, you'll, I had to coach him uh, one-on-one one time. His mom said, uh, get, give him some private lesson, will you? Right. Said, sure. Okay. And I did. And we were working on some drills and he was doing everything. And he stopped me in the middle of the drill and said, why are we doing this? Huh. And I'm like, well, million dollar question. because you, you want to be better at the skill because you're going to be on a team and your other teammates are going to be relying on you to be, be mm-hmm. better at it than you are. Yep. But also you want to be in good shape as a human being. Right. So even when you're not playing basketball, you dream better and you sleep better and you you just feel better as a human right. being because you're in better shape. So, and he goes, those both make good sense. Let's go. <laughs> and we kept going. I tell you off the air who that was. I bet you can you can right. figure it out. Yeah, I know. Um, I probably could. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, with regard to that guy, right? He reminded me so much of the character Sheldon on Big Bang Theory. Oh, okay. That that I wrote to the producers of the Big Bang Theory. Oh, and I said I've got a guy here at the Y mm-hmm. that would be a perfect fill in if you ever do an episode where you go back and <laughs> Sheldon's 13 13 right, years old right that he could come and be Sheldon at 13 right and I said or or just do a whole show about it and of course right. young Sheldon became a show I said I don't right. want any money for it it's just a good idea but I right. got the guy they never used him they used that kid right instead. of course but, but they wow. could have used this guy for <laughs> that, sure there you go it's it's now do you know who I'm talking about uh I think but probably Jim, Jim will know J- yeah. your dad will know yeah, no. Your dad will know. Off camera, we can talk about this, man. But in yeah, the all right. Time, um, I, I guess, um, I guess, uh, building off of that, actually, uh, pretty easily. Um, uh, when interacting with people like this guy, for example, you know, you obviously explained how how you interacted differently with him. But how generally, like with other people of this etiquette, did you like interact differently with them? What adjustments did you make, and why was that the case too? Well, you have to be firm. Uh, mm-hmm. in certain situations because you can't disrupt the entire league right? Uh, or, or, or a game that's going on. So you have yeah. to be firm. And if something, if something is blowing up on the court or right. even during practice, you have to give the coaches, first of all, the parent of that kid has to be around all the time. If you right. know there's bound to be an issue, they've got to be there to be a, a buffer. So we right. sent, first thing we do is take the kid off the court, send them to their parent. Mm-hmm. We, 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 hey, you're doing this. Right. We can't do this. We need you right. to do this. If right. you can't, go sit over there. Right. And so we, we eliminate the problem immediately mm-hmm. uh, because it becomes a danger to the other people in the, in right. the organization, yep. people in the group. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, not my job, not trained for it. Yep. Uh, my job is to run a safe league. Right. When, it, when safety becomes an issue, uh, that, that when somebody's punching somebody or somebody's flipping somebody, some little kids running off the floor, flipping somebody off, you got to get them away from the program right. for a minute and say, Hey, here's, here's the expectation. And we understand that kids can blow up once in a while. Right. No, I did. Here's I the, will happily admit here, that. Right. Here's the expectation though. And how did, how did we treat you when we did that? When you mm-hmm. did that? Yep. We talked, we talked to you about it. Say, Hey, can't do that. Got to do this. Mm-hmm. Try to try to contain yourself. Try to maintain. Just absolutely again. absolutely yeah but i want but i want you to play as hard as you can and right. as well as you can yeah no Go it's, out there, it's, kick it's their a, kick their butts all the time that's what yeah. I. Mean. it's a balancing act once again and, so you got i think i think the way is to is to talk to them mm-hmm. if they won't be talked to remove them right get yeah, them over no. there with their parents and if they still can't participate uh, in a way that's conducive to the overall harmony of the league then you then you gotta let them go and right. we, we had to do that with yeah. with several coaches we had yep. to do that Yep. with several parents we had to do that and with several kids we had to do that mm-hmm. yep no nope. and you know it's it's like it's it's different every time you know you never know what you're going to expect when you meet somebody new so it's like you always have to be prepared for everything and you know yeah i, I don't like it you know yeah. that's the that's the bad part it's the bad right. part of the job but right. but you got no. occasionally you know you get the the needs of the 300 are a little more important than the right. needs of the two on yep. occasion right no absolutely and I guess, you know, it, it's like, you know, once again, building off of something I just built off of, you know, it's like, you know, obviously, you know, all these, 
there are all these different people that you interact with who come into this league. And I guess what I would ask is why did sports and maybe the league itself specifically, you know, have this positive impact on them? And, you know, you too, it's like, you know, how did sports have it, an impact on your life? And, you know, how did it help in addressing these challenges, both for yourself and for these kids too, when they were going through them? Never ending process of learning. <laughs> uh, you know, always. Again, I'm 66, 66 years old. And I, every time I go to camp, yep. I change, I change, I'm a different person when I come back every go. single time. And that's never going to finish. Nope. Uh, and I hope, I hope that it's mm -hmm. for the better. Right. Usually it is, I think. Right. So I'm not a religious person in any way. Spiritually, I. yes. Uh, but I have always used uh, the YMCA program, especially the Rager program from camp. Right. Uh, to guide me. Right. In my guidance of others mm -hmm. to, to help me be a leader of others yep. and a leadership style that I think you'll agree uh, a leadership style that generally is hands off. Let you, let you guys do whatever yep. you want until, until I have to step in. Right. And then, and then I have to say, Oh no, we cannot go to the mess hall in, right. in our underwear. No, we, <laughs> we have to go. Fully clothed. Right. You got, it was your idea. Great. I like it, but mm -hmm. let's maybe not do that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so, so things like that. Yeah. Uh, and, and so coaches would come to me with ideas and I'd be like, let's go for it. Or nah, I don't think that's a safe yep. thing to do. So I, I think that that's why the, why I fit in so well with the right. live program is because I grew you up. You did that very program. well. You did that very I started well. It, I started in day camp when I was six at the Y and I've been going to the Y ever since. And, and it's just part of my life. There you go. It's, it can be that simple and yet that complicated at once, you know, with what and I like to draw and look, I, I want to drag other people. We talked about Rachel Kim. I want her to go to camp to be a camp counselor because she's the kind of person that I want to have leading little kids. Right. Sammy okay. Cohn. I want Dash Decker. Yeah. I want them to come to camp to lead little right. kids as a counselor. I right. want you to come back. You've been at CIT. Right. I want you to come back and screw the bugs. I want yeah. you to come back and be a counselor for a bunch of seven-year-olds. Right. Teach yeah, no. them. Yep. No. You can do that. And listen, man, you know, it's like, I, it's like you said, you know, life is a, ne a never ending learning process. I've absolutely I, same thing, you know, man. And it's like, I don't know how I'm going to learn this stuff. I just know I'm going to learn. You're just it a pup, man. You're just a pup. Imagine uh, how old are you? 17, 16, 17. 17. So I'm um, give me, give you, give yourself what 50 years and you're as old as me. <laughs> yep. Yep. Roughly. Right. But, but, but you but, will be, yep. You will be. And what are you going to, what are you going to do with that time between now and then? No clue, but right. It's like, it's going to happen, make it, but make it good and make mm -hmm. it worthwhile and make it bleed over to other people and, and become somebody that you look up to so that, those kids, yep. those thousand kids that you had under you can then have somebody to look up to and then they can go do it again. Absolutely, man. That, that is the pay, one goal. Pay it I will, forward. That is the one goal I will always hold to achieve and might never, but at the same time, I will always look to try, you know? Yeah. And I guess, um, speaking of goals, you know, I, I think that helps lead into my final question here uh, in terms of, you know, obviously, we're, we're looking to also achieve the goal of, you know, solving the entire problem that comes, you know, with diagnosing these mental health issues, these, these emotional health challenges, you know, and dealing with them, you know, treating them, that kind of thing, I, you know, and obviously we're never going to find the perfect solution to all of this, you know, but we can only try to make it a little better as time yes. goes by. And that has happened, you know, it's like, it's like you said, you know, it, you know, going up back to your talk about, I I'm so sorry, but I forget what disorder it was. You said you believed you had OCD, OCD for sure. OCD. Thank you. Yeah. There might be some other initials around. But right. That right. One for sure. Right. Yeah. And you said how if if, you know, you had grown up like like or I think actually maybe you were talking about me and how if I had grown up 20 years earlier than I did, you know, it's yeah. like it would, it would have been a lot harder for me to deal with my autism and stuff, you know, right. and it's the truth. 
And 50 years ago, 50 years ago, you're that, who's that weird kid over there? Yeah, totally. But that and doesn't I, happen anymore. That doesn't, no. and it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't no. happen then. No. And obviously because of the progress that's made in those 50 years, I don't have to worry about that. Right. But at the, but at the same time, of course, you know, while progress will uh, continue to go forward and people will become e uh, more humble when talking about this stuff and more open, obviously at the same time, that stigma of, you know, people who have opposed this or for whatever reason, what, you know, whatever it is, who, you know, did it, you know, 50 years ago um, and had obviously a much more prevail prevalent base than or uh, cause, you know, it's like they still exist today, even if the, even if the former is not true and that they're prevalent and stuff, they're not. But at the same time, they still better. exist. It's getting right. better. Right. Yeah. But they still exist at the same time. And I guess, yeah, yeah. And, and again, my, and, and, you know, my question, um, you know, now is just like for those kinds of people, you know, who still have that stigma again, for whatever reason, you know, it's like, what do you want them? What is the one thing if you had to pick or a couple things, maybe that you wanted them to know about what dealing with these challenges are and what they should really just appreciate about it more, not take, you know, so seriously, you know, like what's the one thing they should change maybe in their I approach? Think these, day, these days, as you mentioned, it's not as big a deal as it used to be. Everything is above board. It's out there for everybody to know and everybody to deal with. Mm -hmm. So communicate about it and deal with it and don't treat it like it's, it's life and death. Just be matter of fact about it. Right. Move along, get to it. Whatever. Oh, you see the thing behind my head? What does it say up there? Uh, I cannot read that. That thing right there. I, I see it, but I can't it read it. Get so. to it. Oh, wait a minute. I'll bring it up. Yeah, maybe you should. Jeez. Get to it. Wow. That is, that is, in, that is very, that is so true and so interesting all at once. All hail the Venice beach vendors. There you go. <laughs> they, they made this. They made this. <laughs> oh man. I have, I have the other one says, how do you do? And it's, it's in the press <laughs> box at the Coliseum. There you go. It's <laughs> just like that. <laughs> just like that. And we come full circle. Yep, come full circle, just like that. Oh, that is that's awesome. Well, this is an awesome idea that you've you've got going here. Uh, there are innumerable subjects. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Choose. You know, uh, I'd love to see you uh, find somebody in the uh, in the real athlete world. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, absolutely. You know, if I if talk we. About it. If I can ever get a guest like that on this show, I will be overjoyed. Oh, yeah. And I think the conversation well, can, would be so beneficial to everybody listening to this. Yes. Know? If I, I can help you do that, if I, if I know who it is, I'll give them a call for sure. Please, please do so, man. You know, I think it would help all of us in a lot of ways. But um, uh, aside from that, first of all, actually, I, I, I wanted to mention this earlier, but I'll do it now. Shout out to all those guys we talked about who participate in that league, you know, Dash, uh, Rachel. Oh, yeah. You know everybody else. I'm if I forgot. We had a name. thousand kids. We had thousands yeah. of kids come through yeah. there and at camp, and right. and, and yeah. then I go back to 1967 and on, and think of how many kids. And everyone, you know, with social media being what it is these days, right? Every once in a while, right? I'll get I'll get an old athlete from my 1975 Mother of Good Counsel Crusader team will reach out and go, "Oh man, I remember those days." Yeah. Or some baseball team from from the heart pony league 20 years ago there you that, go that's what, yeah that's what it's all about yeah i know but i mean you know again shout out to those guys you have been great to both me and pete you know we we so appreciate what you've done and you know met, bringing you guys back you know both brings back memories and it helps a lot i think it helps a lot in you know just giving us more insights into what went on and why it's so helpful today you know with what we're dealing with so i you know shout out to you guys Pete, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. You know, you were a great guest. You know, we had a lot of fun. And, Happy you know, just please, you know, let's please stay in touch, man. And we'll, I'll be sure to invite you back on the show real soon. I'm sure our audience would be more than happy to have you again. You know, you were awesome. Again, you were awesome today. And we'd love to hear more of your stories. That's for sure. <laughs> Someday when uh, things aren't as tight as Fort Knox and the COVID virus is gone, I'll have you up in the the broadcast booth at, at the Coliseum so you can see what we do there. I think you absolutely, man. 
I will be I will be first in line. You can just text me and I will be there in 10 minutes, man. I will and by just... the same token, when, when you're on the varsity basketball team next year yep. uh, at Pacific, I'll be uh, I'll be out there. There you go. It's it's just like that, man. I like to come watch all my boys and the girls. There you oh. go. Everybody's again, everybody's uh, gets uh, gets your attention. Family. It's family. one big family. Well, you know, I, I'll just say this one more time. Thank you so much for coming. I also want to thank our subscribers and listeners for joining us today. If you're looking for more great content like today's interview, go to please go to our website, uh, www.sportsonthespectrum.net. And then uh, I guess I would just say from Sports on the Spectrum, I'm Keegan Blegner saying so long. And for my younger subscribers, listeners, and viewers, don't forget the three rules of life, which my parents used to tell me when I was young and they still do today. And that is stay safe, have fun, and get dirty. Take care, everybody. We will see you all on the next episode of Sports on the Spectrum. Bye, dog.